Hello, everyone. Sorry. Uh, let's go ahead and stand. Welcome to Alive Youth. It's good to see you guys all here. And um, I just want to invite you into a prayer. If you could just bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this gift that you have blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for constantly watching over our hearts, our minds, and being with us throughout today, throughout our week, throughout our lives. God, I know that you have a great purpose and a plan for all of us here. I pray that you continue to encourage us, continue to uplift us, continue to be reminded of your goodness today. God, we're grateful for all that are here in your presence because we want to worship you, God. We want to thank you, God. We want to welcome you in our hearts and our minds. God, I pray that you bless our worship together. Bless the exhortation, the message, and all that will take place here tonight. We glorify you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. The Lord, amen. So for most of you don't, who don't know, I do books for a uh, living. It's a, it's a side gig. And I was going through my books yesterday, and uh, I had like 300 to go through. And on the back of it, I started reading, and it says about the author in it. It says, praise for this, praise for whatever the author. And I went through one of them and I'm like, oh, that's, that's weird. It says praise. And then I went to the next one and it said praise and the next one. And when I got to the 10th one, I felt convicted. I feel like sometimes, and the Holy Spirit told me, we forget to just praise God. We, we get so caught up with saying, God, I need this, I need this, I need this. But we forget to say, God, you're the King of Kings, you're the Lord of Lords. And I just want to praise you so this morning, let's forget the distractions, what happened prior to today and where we're gonna go after. And let's just, let's just praise God, amen? That silence is the enemies. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are when we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall, for fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lift you high, with all creation cry, God. This is what living looks like. 
This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. See you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall For fear cannot survive when we praise you The God who breakthroughs on our side Forever lift you high With all creation cry God we praise you Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. As Christians, we all claim to have peace in our lives. Uh, we know that the fruits of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. And we all believe that we have peace, we have joy, we have love. Um, and for me, recently, I've experienced peace in a, in a different way. I was praying to God about, about a decision I had to make in my life. And I didn't know whether I had to go right or I had to go left. And my heart was telling me to go right. And that's, that's what I wanted to do. But I wanted to know that I was in the will of God and that I was in accord with God's plan. And I was standing before the Lord and praying and praying. And I, I didn't know what to do. And I was like, God, give me a sign. Like open my eyes somehow with something to know if I should go this way or if I should go the other way. And the weeks went on and I was praying and throughout the weeks as I was working as I was doing whatever I was doing just this thing was constantly on my mind I was like man like I don't I don't know what to do but I have to decide soon and I remember praying one one night and I was like God I, I don't know what to do just give me peace to know if I if this is your will and I remember waking up the next morning and, and like the verse says, I, I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was a peace that surpasses all understanding. And it was like, I just knew that instead of going to the right where I wanted to go, the Lord, it's like he completely shifted my mind and I was, I was now okay with going the other way. And I was now okay with walking down this path. And he filled me with this peace that, that is unexplainable. And many times we come before the Lord with these problems that we have. And we ask for crazy signs like Gideon did. Like, God, if this is your will or if this is in your will, then let, let the moon fall to the earth. Or these crazy things that we ask God to do. When really we have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. That can give us this peace when we're going through different struggles in life. When we don't know what to do, it is the peace of Christ that can tell us what we have to do. And the reason, and I love this verse where Jesus says that you need faith as small as a mustard seed. And for the longest time, I didn't, I, I didn't understand this verse because like, I was like, okay, what's the difference then? If I have faith as small as a mustard seed and I can move the mountains, then what, what could I do with even more faith? And I didn't understand this verse. And there was, there was a moment when I believe the Lord revealed it to me where I now understand it in this way that all, the way to understand this verse is like this. If I truly believe, if I truly believe that God is real, that God created me, that God created all of humanity, that God is king of the world, king of the universe, and he created all of nature to work together perfectly. All of the universe and the solar system to work in such perfection. And this is the king that we believe watches over everything that exists. If I truly believe this, then why would I doubt him in such a small problem or question that I have in my life? Why would I allow this doubt to creep in when all I have to do is understand that the God that I serve is so much greater than this thing that I have in my life and I want us to come before the Lord in this prayer and say God fill my heart with faith to believe that even through this small thing of giving me peace of knowing what to do in my life and maybe you need peace just overall in your life because your life has just been crazy lately God can give you that peace maybe you need peace because you don't know where to go to in life you don't know what path to go down and you're saying God is this your will for my life God can give you that peace and listen when he gives you that peace hold on to it like it's the greatest sign that he can give you and trust him and believe that the Holy Spirit that is in you is alive and he speaks to you let's come before him in this prayer
This is our God, the sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. With you forever we will reign, and all I need is you. And all. It is you, Lord, is you, Lord, and all I need is you. Yes, it's all we need. All I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord, and all I need is you. And all I need is you. You, Lord, and all I need is you. And all I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord, and all I need is you. And all I need is you. And all I need. What a wonderful time of worship. With respect, turn to your neighbor and welcome them to Alive Youth. It's good to see you guys all here today. Welcome to Alive Youth, everyone. It's good to see you guys back. It's been a minute since we've been at Alive Youth, but it was good to see all of you guys at the West Coast Romanian Youth Conference here. Wasn't it great? Yes, God worked and God was good to us. It was wonderful seeing all of you and many more of you guys uh, there. It was, uh, it was beautiful. God worked in a profound way, I believe. Before I continue, I want to just welcome a couple of guests. Please forgive me and not forgive me because I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, Rachel Pelosi, thank you for being here today. You don't have to stand. Uh, God bless you. Uh, Kayla Moldovan, is she here? Yes? Hi. Um, it's good to see you. Welcome. Um, if I'm not mistaken, all the way from Romania. Um, and um, you're our, you are Danny Brazovan's uh, niece, and you'll be with us uh, for the next month, I believe. So it's uh, good to see you again. You're at the park, and um, welcome to Alive Youth. Am I missing anybody else that is here for the first time? Uh, Mokanu? Sorry? Mokan. What's your first name? Petra? Welcome. Nice to see you again. Uh, welcome to Alive Youth. And then welcome all of you guys here uh, back to Youth Night. God bless you guys. I also, uh, at the end of service, if you guys can just keep in the back of your minds, the Stula Next are going to be out of town for about three weeks. They're going to Europe. So may God bless them uh, there and on the way back. We're going to start off with the, the offering. Daniel's going to come around uh, with a basket, and uh, you guys can give in person. Or if you guys would like to, you guys can give online through cell. It's available for all of you guys. May God bless your giving. Our next announcement is our social media platform. As you guys uh, are aware, we have our Instagram, Facebook, and our um, YouTube. Uh, for all of you guys that want to know more uh, intimate and uh, current details, look at our Instagram. Facebook gives you guys all of the 
albums that uh, took part, uh, that were part of events. For example, if you guys um, went to the West Coast Conference, uh, actually on Maranata's account on the Facebook, there, is, there are albums of the services. So just to be aware of that. And then our YouTube gives you guys our most recent um, youth night services. If you do not have those platforms, look at a live Maranatha on all three of those and join us. My next announcement is uh, the youth, youth conference. <laughs> a year ago, it was decided that we would take it on. And it was a feat that was, uh, was amazing. It was a blessing. Um, and I just want to thank all the leadership, the leaders that were part of it, the volunteers that took place in it, every aspect of it um, that uh, required your guys' help. Uh, we just want to thank you guys. We want to thank you on behalf of Maranatha for being there, for helping us out. Uh, for the leaders that are here that reached out to all of the other local churches. Uh, for those of you guys that are going to be watching online, God bless you guys and thank you for everything that you guys did um, at the youth conference. Either participating, volunteering, showing up, helping out in any capacity. May God bless you. And um, I'm excited uh, that God's favor was over us and his grace was uh, with us at the conference. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And um, I know that it's going to be on my heart for the rest of my life. Thank you, David. Uh -huh, yes. <laughs> well, it was uh, not just me, but a lot of hands at work that made it possible. But uh, you guys are too kind. Um, I couldn't have done it without the team. And um, may God bless them. Amen. Our next announcement is... Uh, Right around the corner. That's right. We have limited seats, guys, limited seats. And so please sign up if you have not. Next weekend, we will have our youth retreat that's taking place at Zephyr Point in South Lake Tahoe. You cannot ask for a better location for the price. It is $200 per person. If you're a young individual and you're looking at this and saying $200 is a lot for our ages, yes, it is. But if you ask your parents and they say, Mom, Dad, if you guys have gone on a vacation, how much does it cost to go to a hotel for one night? It's anywhere between, at a good location, $150 to $250 per night. But you guys have the privilege, and we want to bless you guys with four days, three nights guess what? Meals are included. <laughs> so that's, this, this, is, this is awesome. A wonderful experience. Uh, if you guys are planning to come, if you guys have not signed up, pray about it and then just sign up and come. Okay. <laughs> that's how that works. And um, registration is open. If you guys go to our Instagram page, it's in the bio. Uh, the link is there. You guys can sign up. We are encouraging you guys to carpool because it's so close. We want you guys to gather together, hang out, make memories, and uh, we will see you guys there. June 20th through the 23rd is Thursday through Sunday morning. Check-in for all of the attendees are and is at 4 o'clock. What time? 4 o'clock. This week and we will give you guys a lot of information pertaining to the camp. What time to be there, where to park, what to pack, what to bring. Um, and so you guys will be getting that email here in the near future. If you signed up, you will be getting it through the email you guys put on the account. So if it is your parents' account, please ask them. Please, uh, please share that information with me, uh, with me mom and dad. Uh, so once again, Zephyr Point, uh, this year's theme comes out of Proverbs three, five through six, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Amen. The theme, trust in Christ. Don't we need to trust in Christ more often? Yes, we say don't stress, don't worry, but we, we forget that we can trust and lean on the Lord and everything that we do. And so I trust the Lord that he will bring you guys there safe and sound. And if, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I pray that you guys get there safe and sound. And we trust the Lord to work at the, at the camp. And so please, if you have not yet signed up, please do, limited seats. And uh, if you have never been, you're not gonna be disappointed. It's right outside 
uh, uh, your rooms are going to be right outside of uh, South Lake Tahoe, the actual lake. I mean, you're going to step out within 50 feet, you're touching the water. And so please come. And also, I looked at the weather. It's actually going to be really, really nice. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's going to be really, really nice. It's going to be like in the 70s and maybe 80s. And I mean, it's better than that. the same weekend next weekend here in Sacramento. It's 106 and 108. I'm just saying, if you want to avoid the, <laughs> the hot weather, come to South Lake Tahoe. Um, so please sign up. It is uh, right around the corner. So we will not have youth night next Friday, but I hope to see you guys all there. We are um, sending out the invitation to all of the local Sacramentians. If you guys have friends that are in different churches, different communities, please invite them to come and join us. It's for everyone. Our next announcement is VBS. Yes. Majority of you guys that are the youth here are always involved in helping out with this, which is awesome. Uh, vocational Bible school, correct? Yes, I didn't, I didn't miss that. Sorry? Vacation, vacation Bible school. Yeah, school. Um, the theme for this year is Rooted in Christ. It's a wonderful, wonderful theme, and I pray that God blesses them. If you guys want to know more information, please talk to Jenny. If, um, if they still need some help, please talk to her. And uh, it is July 12th through the 13th. July 12th through the 13th. Our next announcement is our first Friday Park Days. Yes, how many of you guys were at the last one? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, I was there. Uh, it was awesome. It was great. We had a plethora of people. I mean, it was phenomenal. Um, over 100 people were there, which was great. And um, I just want to keep you guys posted on what's coming up next. Uh, with July, the next month, uh, it's 4th of July on Thursday. And the 5th, we usually would have made it a park day, but we're going to postpone this one. We're going to um, let you guys enjoy your 4th of July. So if you guys end up going out of town, please enjoy it that weekend. Uh, so July, there is no park day, but please tell your friends uh, and cousins and aunts and families. Um, August 2nd at 6 p.m. and September 6th at 6 p.m. They're both Fridays and we will be having uh, park days. And so, if you guys were not there, we had uh, pulled pork. Thank you, Benny. And coleslaw. Thank you, Miriam. And the rest of you guys that helped, God bless you. It was really, really good. I enjoyed it very, very much. And uh, I can't wait for the next one. And so, Harry Crab in Roseville, 6 p.m. I hope to see you guys there next time. Our next announcement with so many events that are happening in this summer, <laughs> we're just going to try something a little bit different this, this time. We're going to have a summer break, guys. <laughs> and we just had, I felt like a summer break right before uh, tonight with the conference and so many other things that were happening, Park Day, uh, that we thought, let's kind of give you guys a short break with so many events happening here. We're talking about camp. We're talking about VBS. I'll be talking about our church camp here in a minute. There's a lot of things that are happening. There's park days, etc. cetera, 4th of July, holidays. There's so many things that are happening. And so alongside your guys' school's break, I hope that we can relieve a little bit of stress uh, from your guys' summer break. And you guys can enjoy your Fridays um, from June 21st through August 2nd. Now, June 21st, where are you going to be? That's right, Tahoe, camp. So um, you're starting off your summer break with a bang. <laughs> so are we taking a break? I don't know. I mean, it depends on how you see it. But uh, I feel like we're going to just be meeting almost every single weekend of the summer break. So instead of here, we'll let you guys enjoy it outdoors and um, elsewhere. So just to be aware of that, share this information with your friends and family because I guarantee you, Mike is going to be seeing a few people showing up on Friday nights throughout the month. And Mike's like, I won't even be here. Um, so we'll make that post online for all to see. So I hope to see you guys throughout the summer break. Our next announcement is our church camp that we're doing with the entirety of the church this weekend, July 24th through the 28th. As I mentioned, there's so much going on. 
big reservoir, as you guys know it, Morning Star. It's up north on Highway 80. Uh, if you guys want information, contact Mike. Um, he is the guy for all of the information. If you guys are coming with the family and you guys are coming with the camper, please talk to him. If you guys are coming and you guys want to bring a tent, please still talk to him. If you guys are coming in general, it doesn't hurt to share that information um, with Mike as well. And um, 24th is a Wednesday. 28th is a Sunday. So just to be aware of that, that whole week end per se, uh, we're doing a church camp with our church, and that is exciting. It's wonderful to see, and it's so different to see a pastor come at the park or come at uh, our uh, at the at the camp in shorts and a hat or something like that. I love seeing that. It's like, whoa! I have never seen you in regular clothes. I've always seen you in church clothes throughout my my weeks and my weekends. Um, So it's awesome to connect and um, be with friends and family and our local church family at this place. Um, I've enjoyed it the times that I have gone, and it is wonderful. Uh, What's wonderful about it as well is that there's not much connection for the internet. And so you can breathe and connect with the Lord and connect with the people around you and, uh, you know, if you guys were not born, but remember the 80s, remember the 70s, not you, when cell phones and internet was not readily available, you know, so <laughs> yeah, you know, and um, yeah, this is, uh, this is a good time to get out and just to enjoy uh, what God has created, and so I hope to see you guys there. Please let Mike know if you guys are planning to come, and which day so he can help you guys. There is a fee per car, but like anywhere, there's always a fee. There's a fee for um, the campers, etc. With that being said, um, I hope to see you guys on Sunday morning, and uh, I would like to invite our guest speaker tonight, all the way from Sacramento, California, uh, Dario Mois. God bless you, and uh, may we give him a round of applause. Thank you. Citrus Heights, California. It's like uh, the OC people. It's not LA, it's Orange County. Get it straight. All right, if you have your Bibles, um, go ahead and open to Daniel 1 if you want to follow or the screen, Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to try to not use a dial-up speed, use a fast speed. All right, so uh, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of of God. And he brought them to the land of Sinar, uh, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief Enoch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and and the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of uh, of the time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the Enoch's gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Uh, Abednego. But Daniel reserved, resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the Enoch's to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the Enoch's. And the chief of the Enoch's said to Daniel, I feared for my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink, for why should you see that you were in worse condition than the, youth, than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the Enoch had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and drink and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them, and in this matter he tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days he w- it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables." As 
For these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature, literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all vision and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded the, that they should be brought in, the chiefs of the Enochs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. Amen. I'll stop there. What a nice story. Now, don't go to sleep. Um, I know it's late, and I'll whoosh, speed up. But, uh, you know, I started this message thinking about friendships, and I will end with friendships because that's how the Lord works. <laughs> um, the title of the message is Identity, Conviction, and Friendships. All right. Put on your apron or whatever you put the bib because, you know, it's going to be juicy. So... Um, I just want to look at some of the, these principles, these three, identity, convictions, and friendships. They're all tied. Um, and basically, you know, this could be for young people, but really for anybody. Um, and applying some of these principles in our life is vital for us to be what the Paul says, worthy of the calling of Christ. And so right from those the verses 3 and 4 where we see that um, Nebuchadnezzar gets these youth from Judea. I won't read the verses, but it's verses 3 and 4. And um, he brings them from this royal family or noble families and takes them into his, um, into his land, to his God. Um, and I looked at those verses and I was like, you know what? That is so much like us. Now, I know when you read the story, you just read it for what it is. And then you go deeper, you know, which is what we do Monday nights. We invite you there. We go deep, deep, and we look like, how is that like us? It is like us. Let's go through some, some of the things that, those characteristics that identify us with these people. Um, if we make the side-by-side -side comparison, we'll see this. These young men were prisoners of war, and so are you, and so am I, and so are all of us. Prisoners of war. Okay, well, let's see how. We talked about in how they were prisoners of war because they were in Judea, they were conquered. But what war are we in? We're not in, thank God, we're not in no war, physical, okay? We're not like Ukraine, who's at war with Russia, or vice versa, whatever, or the Israel with uh, Hamas or whatnot. But we are in war. Um, so for those of us who have been born again, um, we understand that we were prisoners at one point, and the prison, the the war we're talking about is a spiritual war, of course. And the prison was more or less our desires, our sinful passions, uh, disobedience towards God. That's in plain language. Again, I'm going to go relatively fast so we don't spend too much time. But not so fast that you miss the point. Um, and maybe you're here tonight, because I know I'm not speaking to just people who don't know the Lord. But maybe you're here tonight, and even though you were rescued, the enemy is still trying to enslave you, but, um, and he's trying to make use of your natural desires that God put inside of you to use them for sin. That's what the devil does. That's how he enslaves us. Uh, and this is the war. This is the war that we are fighting, we as Christians. Paul, in Romans, he talks about this war. He says, I'm going to read a couple of verses from Romans 7, 22 to 24. And I think it highlights the, con the constant struggle we are in. For I joyfully agree with the law of God. Do you agree with the law of God? That you should not sin, of course. Mentally, we're all in the inner person. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. The law which is in my body's parts. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? That's what Paul is saying. That's us. We're constantly at war. If you think you're not at war, you lost. Because what does the enemy want? For you to put down your defenses. Um, so if you are one of these people who has not been able to answer that question, who will set me free from this body of the body of this death? Well, the answer is Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And you have to understand the answer is not just Jesus. But it's Jesus through the Holy Spirit. He has to work in you. And Jesus portrayed that when he lived here on earth. He himself was guided by the Holy Spirit. He himself said, I do nothing of myself, just what God tells me through the Holy Spirit. So 
if you are still fighting this war, and sometimes you lose, and it could be sins, temptations, it could be some, I'm not going to go in, you know what it is, the Holy Spirit's putting things on your mind anyways. You need to learn not to lean on your own wisdom and understanding or strength, just like the theme. But instead, pray for power, power from the Holy Spirit to help you overcome. You need power. We need power. In every, it doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter. Okay, that's the war, prisoners of war. Some of us are still fighting the war. And until you die, you're going to fight the war. Sorry. That's all of us. These young men were taken to a foreign land to serve a foreign god, another thing that we identify with. We live in a foreign land, and in this land, people worship a foreign god. Okay, just like it happened there. Um, I don't know about you, but me, this, you know, this is how you identify this land as being foreign. I don't know if, but I'm sure most of you have felt the anointing of God at some point during worship, during prayer, during times in your life. I don't know, whenever. But isn't it that when you feel that presence, there's something inside of you that wishes that just would go on forever? And Paul says, I wish I was able to depart from you, but now you need me. He writes that to the Corinthians, I believe. Uh, and so, you see, this is how you know. It's like, it's like you know, this is not our home. We, we know. And the moments we get close to God, that's when we realize this is not where, how it should be. It's not an everyday life. You know, you go to work and whatnot. But once you, you, know, you get in the presence of God and you really feel that anointing and his presence, you're like, I don't belong here. I don't want to be here. I'd rather be with God in his presence, always feeling that, that, I don't know what to call it, like emotional, spiritual ecstasy almost. It's like I'd rather be in that high all the time. And that's, that's, how, that's how you know this land is foreign. Uh, the God of this world, or maybe the gods of this world, have a grip on the people of this world. And more importantly is that we realize that and we try to snatch them, just like Paul says, out of the grips of hell. And we pull them like out of hell. May God give us that conviction. Uh, because their gods, which are greed, pride, lust, anger, adultery, and so many others, enslave them. And God, and so we need to show them the freedom that we live in, the freedom we have not to sin. That's the freedom we have. And just like those three guys were living in that land, they had no choice because they were prisoners. We have no choice. We're still on earth. We can't just go, whoops, I'm out of here. I wish. But we have to show people that we have the freedom to choose, just like they did. And that freedom is much more powerful than the, what they call freedom. Okay? We're going to talk about those convictions and those lusts and whatnot later. Finally, not that there can't be said other things, but the third point is that these men were of royal descent. Now, you may think, or you may wonder, well, I'm not of royal descent, you know what I mean? My parents are just regular guys. Uh, maybe some of you guys have, like, some high-end, you know, whatever, parents. But, but most of us are just regular people. We're not royal. We're not noble. Well, here's what's fun. Royalty is not something you earn. This is, this is something important to understand. You don't get to become royal. You're just, you're born royal. Do you understand that? You, you are either born in a royal family or you're not. You don't just get to be royal. You don't go and sign up. Can you, can I, can I have royal? No. Okay, you, you're just born. And the cool thing is that Jesus said that nobody can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So that being born again is how you become royal. That's how you are royal. You're not royal by earthly, you know, means. You're not royal because you belong to, I don't know, Prince or King Charles. Uh, but you're royal because you belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So how much more royal is that? Actually, the Bible says that from whom all royal lineages derive from God. So we are actually very much like these people in the sense that we are royal. But don't let the devil fool you. Because, you know, the devil would rather have you think you're just a casual person. God has no interest in you. And that's, if you go down that line, you're going to be in for a short, you know, short stay. Romans 8, 16 and 17a says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, 
heirs of God and fellows, fellow heirs with Christ. So you see, if Christ is king, and if you name Christ king, and you are with him, then you are also a king. That's what the Bible promises us. But sometimes titles are nice, but they come with expectations. You can't just hold a title and trash that title. Okay? Um, yeah, you know that because we have this in the news. You all know about Prince Harry. Yeah, he's living in the U.S. Why in the world would you live in the U.S. when you own, you know, like so many things in England? Well, he shamed his family and he's rejected. So nobody wants to live in a place where they rejected. But the point is, he didn't live up to his royalty, okay? He said things, he did things. I don't get into the whole politics of things. But the point is, you can't just have a title and because of that, you know, everybody's just going to bow. You have to live up to that title. So the fun thing about that is that we also have a responsibility to carry. Uh, and that responsibility actually gives us purpose as well and identity. Okay, I'm gonna, I said identity leads to responsibility, which leads to purpose. And the verses that we had for the conference clearly tell us this principle. It says, 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10. This is about identity. But you are a chosen people, a royal priest. This is not talking about the Jews. It's talking about us or people who believe in Christ. Identity. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And here's the responsibility part. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, and now here's our purpose, but now you are the people of God. You, have, you, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, this first introduction was about identity. And how important is identity? Um, honestly, the more you start thinking about it, and I know when you write a message or when, when you sit there and think about you know, the Word of God and you think about identity, you start realizing, man, identity is everything. But when you sit in the pews or if you're like a student, you're just like, yeah, okay. But let me tell you, it's crucial. Identity, who you are, your beliefs, is crucial to a fulfilled life. Sometimes people are like, yeah, life is just whatever. But not really, because if you have an unfulfilled life, then you will know sooner or later. And then it also, knowing your identity helps you overcome sin and become mature in Christ. Um, if you don't have this well-defined identity, then by definition, your identity is that of a person who's lost and wavering back and forth. Just going back and forth. That's your identity. If you don't have one. Somebody once said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. But that's true. You have to have some beliefs about something or else you will fall. Um, Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, I may or may not read it. But it says, it teaches us that by growing in our identity in Christ, by means of apostles' teaching, prophetic word, biblical teaching, pastoral guidance, we become mature, and as a result, we, all, we will be able to overcome false teachings and the devil's schemes which lead to sin. This is important. Identity is, like, crucial. Um, so in the time of crisis, your identity is the only thing that's, that remains. When all is stripped away, what we believe remains, and that which we believe is what shapes who we become. Trust me, it's like a process. What you believe is what you become. Uh, now people say, oh, is that like biblical? It is. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. It's a Proverbs. Uh, now in the first part, again, I looked at the practicality of this chapter, and I pointed out this three, four friends, Daniel and his three friends. Uh, they're at war. They're in a land of foreign gods, but they're, just, they're not just some regular people. They're royal people. Uh, by actually physical royal, they're not, or noble, they're not actually just spiritually royal, uh, and they have a purpose, and they know their purpose, and they know their identity. Now I want to look at two more, two things, I said conviction and friendships. Uh, these two things that may not seem so important, but can completely pull us away from doing God's will, and they're tied to identity, okay, that's kind of why they work together. Um, these young men, these three, well, Daniel and the three, his three friends, had a conviction, okay? 
their conviction was super strong. I mean, they, was, they, were, they were willing to risk their lives and the lives of their like supervisor, <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, and um, they, um, you know, they didn't have a problem in this trial. They didn't have a problem because of their conviction. But you all know the rest of the chapters because they had other convictions. Daniel had a conviction not to obey the decree that the king gave, and it wasn't that easy. He got thrown in the lion's den. And the other three decided, uh, we were really convicted about worshiping this idol, and they got thrown in the fire. And, you know, it, your convictions are not uh, always easy, okay, to, like, deal with. But what I like about it, and I, I, I drew this principle, is like that if you're faithful in those little convictions, God will be with you when it matters, when the fire gets you in the lions, you know what I mean? Because when it comes to food, you're like, yeah, you know, I, I don't think we should eat this, or I don't think we should drink this, or I don't think we should do that, and then you do it. So when the bigger trial comes, you're not going to make it. And God might not even be there, because your faith will be weak. It's not that God doesn't want to be there, but your faith won't be there um so um and by the way these convictions they're they go hand in hand with the fear of the lord you, you can't have a strong conviction and not fear the lord you just can't the two of them are mutually exclusive if you don't fear god you're not going to have any good convictions and if you fear god you will um and um They're not easy to obey. I already said that. So what is a personal conviction? Simply put, okay, besides the judicial term convicted and or not convicted, the conviction, a personal one, is a belief about or a strong belief about something or an opinion about something or a strong belief or firm belief. Um, and so I'm only going to talk about, there's so much that it can be said about uh, convictions. I'm only going to talk about one thing, the subjectivity of, of convictions. We want to know what convictions are worth following and what convictions are maybe not so. So those ones that are worth following are not subjective and the other ones are subjective. Um, and I want to point out that it is conviction that helped the apostles, all but one, die for the cause of the gospel. It was conviction that helped them die for the cause of the gospel. The question is, are we able to die, not physically, but just towards, I don't know, Facebook or whatever websites or whatever, like, passions. Are we willing to die towards those? Or we have enough conviction for that? That's a question that we should ask ourselves. Um, and so, they had some, they obviously had some sort of a um, proof because they all saw Jesus come from the death, you know, and they all saw him go to heaven, okay? And so, their conviction was based on reality, and I would argue that your convictions also need to be based on reality. And that reality is something that God dictates, not what man dictates. I'm going to give you, per I'm going to give you some example. God says sin, which basically means disobeying his will, leads to death. The world says sin gives you pleasure. Who is correct? Both. They're both right. What in the world? That was, wrong. That was the wrong answer. <laughs> no, they're both right. Sin is pleasure, and sin will lead to death. What do we do? Well, um, this is a conundrum a little bit. So the reality is that uh, the world and the devil is not always lying to you. Okay? Look at me. They're not always lying to you. But... It only uses half-truths, half-truths. That's, that's the devil's, like, secret enemy. That's why he's called deceiver. He deceives you. I mean, think of the first, the first sin, because it just lays the groundwork for every other sin. What did Satan ask Eve? He said, I'll read from Genesis 3. Oh, wait. Uh, no, what did he say? I didn't. I wrote it down somewhere. But it basically, said, "Did God really say that when you will eat from this tree, from this tree, you will die?" That's what he said. And then, um, so 
God, Satan said, you will not die. The day you eat from this tree, you will not, the, you will not die. Uh, and your eyes will be open, you will be like God. Now, was Satan lying? No. He was not lying. Look what God says in, verse, in Genesis 3.22. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. Well, that's what Satan told her. If you eat this tree, you will become like him. So was that a lie? No. But it wasn't the whole truth. <laughs> it, was, it was partial truth. And God said, I'll read the whole, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take fruit also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So you see, Satan doesn't completely lie because that would be too obvious. It's like, yeah, no, get out of here. Like we would all just not fall for it. He's just used what we call smoke in mirrors. Have you guys heard of that saying? It's when you take, you know, you draw somebody's attention on something they like and you kind of make them forget about the other parts that they don't like. That's the actual definition, you know. So you distract them with the reality of the smoke, not the reality of what's actually happening. So the devil said, you know, when you eat from this tree, you will become like God. And God didn't say that's false. But God said, when you will eat, you will also die. And so the devil just kind of like covered, eh, you know, that, that doesn't matter. Don't look at that. It's all not important. Sin gives you pleasure. You can't lie to yourself that sin doesn't give you pleasure. Come on. You kidding me? Sin gives you pleasure. But you have to focus on the other reality that sin leads to death. If you focus on sin gives you pleasure, what are you going to do? Sin. <laughs> it's basic. Nobody's going to, you know, Satan's very smart. I mean, he's not, he's been at this game forever. He, he tricked a third of God's angels. Come on. You think we're smarter and better than that? Those people, those angels were in God's presence. We just feel God's presence sometimes. So if he's that cunning, what do you think? We have a crazy enemy to fight. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to help us discern. Um, so why do you think Eve fell for temptation? Because she had, you know, again, she was light and her conviction wasn't very strong. But I want to tie conviction to identity because this is important. Look at some other cases and look at Satan's way of addressing people. Okay, in Genesis 3, 1, the way he addresses the woman says, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? When he goes to Job, he says, well, he goes to God and talks to God about Job. And he says, then Satan answered to the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a fence around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. But reach out, his, your, reach out with your hand now and touch all that he has. He will certainly curse you to, the, to your face. That's, you got to sometimes, you know, you got to plan against your enemy. Because if you don't plan, you're going to lose the battle. Then he goes to Jesus. Let's look at, I mean, there's more cases, but I just chose these three. And the first temptation of the three, he says, if you are the son of God, do what? Make these stones into bread. Command these stones to become bread. So there is a common thread here in what, how the devil works and how to overcome. Because of the two, of the three, only two fail and one overcame. Thank God Jesus overcame. Um, the questions that Satan asks challenge the person's belief okay think about it did god say and he, he satan's so crazy he even like challenges god ah you think he believes in you because for no reason i mean he's, he's going out of his mind um so um let's see what they did eve why did eve fail what eve did and I believe we have a wrong understanding. I don't think Eve was sitting right next to the tree when devil, the devil came to her. I mean, what in the world was she doing there? I think the devil came to her one day randomly and was like, Hey, did God really say blah, blah, blah? And then he was like, Oh, yeah, he said. And then some other day, or maybe later that day, she was walking by and she looked at the tree. That's what the Bible says. That the woman paused. Hmm. This tree looks good. And it looks like it can make you wise. That's what the Bible says. Huh. I want to see. I wonder. Why, let me, can I try it? And then, boom. 
The problem is Eve flirted with sin. Isn't that funny? Because that's what we do sometimes. We know it's sin. I mean, dear God, God said, it's sin. You know, she even said it with her own mouth. No, God said, don't, eat, don't even touch it. And then she goes and does the exact thing. Because she was flirting with sin. She was just like, yeah, I wonder what happens if I sit here. I wonder what happens if I get closer <laughs> and closer. <laughs> well, the inevitable happens. Job justified himself. Oh, man, I did everything, you know, and God's not fair. And, you know, to his friends, of course. But what did Jesus do? It's interesting. Definitely not one of them. He didn't justify himself. He wasn't like, I'm not hungry. <laughs> he didn't say, hmm, yeah, those rocks, they could make a nice ciabatta bread. <laughs> no. He was like, it is written. You know, he just, Psh! the sword, right? Because that's what the word of God is called, the sword. It is written, Satan. He didn't sit there to contemplate, to... Uh, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, you're right. I mean, it's been 40 days on the dime. Like, I could eat. What? Yeah, let's go. No, because of the way the Satan posed that question. If you are the son of God, it's like, yeah, I am the son of God. But if he did whatever he said, then he would have questioned that, basically. So Jesus is like, no, it is written. Get the point. Convictions based on our beliefs and our justifications are weak and will fail us. If you just have those, and if you sit there and like try to reason, those kind of beliefs, not the ones that come from God, the ones that you're like, mm, I wonder, uh-uh, you will fail. Don't try to justify doing some sin, because you will fail. I've done it, okay? Guilty. And if I ask any one of you, you've all, you're all guilty. Where you try to justify something and... It's like, you know, here, I'll give you a perfect example. You decided to fast for the day. And you're like, ah, oh, I'm really hungry. And God will, you know, I made a promise, but God will forgive me. Yes, God will forgive you. But the point is you failed. <laughs> okay. So there you go. That's, that's an easy one. Okay. We're not going to get into deep stuff. Just simple. And, and almost any of us who have fasted have fell for that. Because our conviction was weak. Because we start justifying how God will forgive us. And he, he will, but, you know, keep your promises. That's what the Bible says. Conviction based on what is written. Now, those will never fail you. And I love the fact that you guys just asked, where is it written? <laughs> in your mind. Because this is a huge topic nowadays. Where does it say in the Bible you should not vape? kidding me i'm sure they had hookahs back then because turks were around but seriously no it doesn't say in the bible you should not vape what does it say i don't know some people come with all kinds of stupid stuff like that i should wear my skirt above my knees <sighs> here's where it says hebrews 8 hebrews 8 i love hebrews this is where it is written okay Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will bring about a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care about them, says the Lord. For, th for this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they will not teach each one his fellow citizen and each one his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, for the, from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful towards their wrongdoings, and their sins I will no longer remember." Well, that promise started when Jesus resurrected. And everybody who believes, that applies to them. So don't go looking in the Bible where it does it say not to vape. Go and ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, why should we not vape? You might think that's a stupid question. But let me tell you, you need a written conviction on your heart. Otherwise, if you try to justify it like Eve, before you know it, you're going to end up with a vape in your mouth somehow. 
It just happens. And then you wake up because that's what the devil does, right? He's like, ha ha, see you sinned. Like Nelson in The Simpsons. So, no, you need the Holy Spirit. It's that still small voice. Remember, the Holy Spirit is that still small voice. We don't always hear it. You know why? Because we're too busy. We're so busy. We got kids and jobs and sermons to prepare for. Um, but the Holy Spirit's there trying to convict you and speak to you and say, hey, stop. Listen. Write this down. Do this. Go there. Like Chris was saying. And boom, he just changes your trajectory. And you're like, wow, what? what? How did I think about that? Well, I don't know. You didn't stop to think about it. That's why the Lord says, be still and know that I'm God. So you understand it. Um, so once you have that written on your heart, you have that strong conviction, then you'll be able to say enough. Enough with sin. Enough with mediocrity. Enough with being fake. Then you'll be able to say, God, I want more of you with real passion. Finally, like I said, friendship. This is how I, was gonna, I always started this message, but uh, I was like, God, oh, this is just weird. It's not, getting, it's not going there. But the Holy Spirit's like, no, no, go in this other direction. Okay, cool. But here we are. Friendships. Um, these four guys, if you read about them, they stuck together. If you read in the, in the Bible, we read it. I'm not going to reread it. Daniel was the one who went to the head, Enoch, and was like, hey, can we try this thing? And his friends were like, we're with you, man. We're with you. Um, and they had this strong conviction, all of them. Friendships matter. Okay? But let me tell you, um, we live in a day where friendships are superficial and artificial <laughs> and virtual. Okay? And that's somewhat depressing, but, okay, uh, I really want you to think about all those friendships and maybe more about the virtual and artificial ones than the ones that are like physical, but don't forget about those. Because today, friendships are more than just people. Today, friendships are easily identified by looking at the thread and the reels that are generated by the algorithms that you are training. You're training those algorithms, you know that? I'm not going to tell you how. Took a class, almost blew my, blew my brains out trying to figure out all the math behind it. I was like, oh, I thought I knew math, but this is next level. I think you need a master's in math to take that class. But anyways, you're training those. You're like teaching them. Ding, ding. And then eventually... What, does, what do they say about you? If I put you on blast and just pull out your TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, X, whatever. We can see the threads. We can be like, ah. Oh. used to be said, tell me who your friends are, and I can tell you who you are. Now, <laughs> tell me what your reels are about, and I'll tell you who you are. Right? If, you know, you look at some of us guys, construction... <laughs> <laughs> projects, cars, I don't know. Hey, I didn't say it's wrong, necessarily. Although I did, and I'll say this. You know, there's one commandment, I forget which one. Maybe the eighth one, because, you know, who remembers the last ones? Thou shalt not covet, you know? Don't desire what somebody else has. Well, social media completely violates that. Because every time you look there, you're like, man, I want that. Oh, that's nice. Why don't I have that? Dude, I got to have that thing. I'm going to go to that coffee shop. Because <laughs> that's what happens. That's reality. That's what these friendships do. Um, so the problem with friendships, again, could be physical friends, could be the stuff we're watching. I'm not talking about necessarily bad stuff, but they could be bad stuff. Could be movies, could be shows, could be... Websites could be songs. I don't know. So many things. Um, they trap us. That's the problem. They trap us. And they render us what, useless for God's kingdom. That's the problem with them. You know, and you get caught up in this hobby and God's like, I want you to evangelize. And you're like, but my 67 Mustang has to be fixed. Okay. And God's not saying your 67 Mustang doesn't have to be fixed. But you're not doing his will. Um. So, through the wrong friendships, the devil tries to destroy our spirit-led convictions, 
which in terms destroy our view on who we really are, our true identity. And I'm getting close to closing, but I had to mention this song, Cycles, by Jonathan McReynolds, because it's so, so powerful about this. It says, didn't I conquer this last year? Tell me what I missed, because I fear that it's coming back up again. Must be some song I ate. Must be something I ate. Some song, some show, some hate. And by the way, you can fill in some ungodly friends, some sites, some reels I saw. That, all those things. The devil wants to extend the game, free throws. And when it ends, he wants to make the sequel. Because if he has another chance, he feels like he can take my joy, my peace, my faith. Yeah. See, the devil, he learns from your mistakes, even if you don't. That's how he keeps you in cycles. That's how he keeps you trapped. Amazing song. Um, my challenge for all of us, I'm not exempt. I wish I was. I wish I was perfect. But is to surround ourselves with holy people. We talked about having being a holy generation. How do you do that practically? Surround yourself with holy people. You have to. Because they, they form you, they shape you. Holy things, you know, when you pull up your reels, it should be Bodhi Valken, is that his name? Paul Washer, those guys. Okay, if you don't know who they are, that's just bad. You need to know who those guys are. Those are good guys. Um, don't worry, I'm, I'm not convicting you, just lightly. People, you need to surround yourself with people that have convictions driven by their identity in Christ. Not about, you know, how they feel. Love Kirk Franklin, but man... He's, yeah, he's got some other convictions. People like, I like the guy. People like Christ himself. Man, this is so easy. You know, we just read about Christ and think about what he says, and boom, there we are, surrounded with him. People like Paul, who had the audacity but the faith to say, follow in my footsteps. How many of us can say that? That's not easy. I wish. Maybe in some spots, but not everywhere. It's like, follow right there. It's good. Then get up. No, no, not there. Don't go there. And pick up again. You know? But no, Paul said, no, no, no. Follow in my footsteps. And then people who live a life of faith and fought the good fight of faith until they, wa they went to see the Lord whom we also await. It's important to look at people who live their whole life as faithful people. You know, some people have their seasons and they derail. We all have choices. You know, Paul could have gone haywire too, but he decided to stick with it. That's why it's called fight the good fight of faith. It's never over until you die. Um, and may the Lord help us. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand. And may God help us to, again, really know our identity. Know that we are his. We're royal. We're royalty. And actually, not in a joking way, but in like real life, God is made us his children, and then um, let those written convictions from the Holy Spirit guide us instead of our feelings and our, you know, fears and emotions, and then to help surround yourself with good friends, good people, good websites, good reels, good sermons on YouTube, you know, you can, good podcasts, don't Spend time on junk. There's so much junk out there, and you got to filter all that stuff. But even for that, the Holy Spirit is there to just guide you. Let's go ahead and go in prayer.
Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for coming to Alive Youth. Um, I just a little information actually pertaining to the camp. Wanted to let you guys know about the speakers. We have Chris Trata, Jason Cutta, and Andy Cutta that we're going to be giving the messages this coming up weekend. So I hope to see you guys all there. Share the information to sign up in the link in the bio on our Instagram page, Alive Maranatha. God bless you guys and enjoy the rest of your night. Behold the land of grace and truth. The image of the Father's outstretched hand. This act of love, this sacrifice.